Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, hope you can hear me okay. Um, so you've seen moths on country file or somewhere like that, and you think, you thought, oh, I'll have a go myself. It looks interesting. And then you realize, wow, there are two and a half thousand species. Uh, they all look the same. Well, they don't really, but when you're first starting, they all look the same, don't they? Uh, how do you on earth get started with it and try to sort out this two and a half thousand species? Uh, so tonight's talk is really designed in two parts. One is to uh, talk about what the Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths are. Uh, how do you tell a butterfly from a moth? What are macros and micros, which you'll hear quite a lot uh, from moth people? When do moths fly? What do the adults and larvae feed on? Where do you find them? How do you attract them? And lastly, how you identify them? So that's what we're going to cover tonight. And next week's talk, we'll talk about how does a moth, which is essentially a nocturnal creature, survive during the day? How does it avoid gaynetin or predated? Uh, all the different camouflage techniques that it uses. And then we'll go on to talk about how the situation with moths is uh at the moment okay so let's get going most people in who uh, start in moths are usually attracted by one particular moth they think oh wow how can something like that exist in this country you never realized it and this is my uh moth which did just that this is the um the burnished brass and it doesn't do it justice those yellow colors are actually like um gold gold leaf it's most incredible moth and it started me off on this 40 year journey now looking at moths but let's um talk about what moths are moths and butterflies are members of what we call the lepidoptera and they are characterized by having scales on their wings and these scales fit like tiles on a roof. And when you're looking at a moth like this peach blossom here, you're actually looking at colored scales. In other words, you can't see the, the actual wing itself. It's covered with a layer of scales. You can't see the membrane of the wings. All this, what looks like hairs here are modified scales. And these scales themselves are quite intricate. Some of them have lots of ridges, and between the ridges there are lots of holes where uh, pigments, granules reside. Uh, and quite often the structure of these ridges is what gives some of the metallic colouring on uh, moths and butterflies. Rather than a colour, it's an interference effect. So moths and butterflies or both have these uh, scales on their wings. Uh, the other thing which characterizes moths and butterflies is the proboscis, which is usually coiled up inside the mouth. There's one or two primitive species of butterfly, uh, Lepidoptera, which don't have a coiled proboscis. But on the whole, the scales plus the coiled proboscis make it a Lepidopteran, if you like. The nearest thing which causes confusion with people are the caddis flies, and they don't have scales on their wings, they have, they have hairs, hence the name trichoptera, which means uh, hairy uh, winged. Uh, so you can actually see the wing membrane here, it's coloured, but if you look closely, you'll see it's got lots of hairs, just like someone who hasn't shaved for a day or two. Uh, and the caddis flies always seem to have their antennae sticking out in front. The life cycle of a typical Lepidopteran is one of egg, which are highly sculptured, caterpillar, pupae, and then adult. That's the typical Lepidopteran life cycle. So here we have a typical Lepidopteran larva. This is the buff tip, and you can see it's got six legs at the front. These are the legs which the adult moth or butterfly will have when it emerges from its cocoon. And then it has a set of four pro legs here 
four pairs and a clasper at the end. A modification of that is just to have one pro leg at the end here, the middle ones are missing. Uh, here's the six at the front. And it, these have a sort of looping uh, method of moving a bit. And that's why the Americans call them inchworms. They move along as if they're measuring the, um, uh, the ground. But to confuse us all, there are other insects which have caterpillars and the uh, sawflies are one. Uh, garden rose sawfly, you've probably all seen eaten, eating your roses. But they too have six legs here, but they have more than four pro legs. They've got five or even six pairs of uh, pro legs. So you can tell that that's a, not a Lepidopteran uh, larva because of the number of pro legs there. So how do we tell whether we've got a butterfly or a moth? In fact, we shouldn't really distinguish them because butterflies are just day flying moths, really. Sorry, Mike, but that's the way it is. Um, there are 76 odd species of butterfly, but two and a half thousand species of moth. So moths far outweigh them. But in this country, we uh, in Europe, there are various ways we can tell them apart. One of the old wives tales is that butterflies fly during the day and are colorful and moths fly at night and are dull brown. Well, these are not butterflies, yet they're colorful and they habitually fly during the day. There's something like, I think, 140, 150 species of moths which fly during the day. Butterflies can hold their wings above their body and moths don't. Well, here's a moth perfectly well holding its wings above the body and quite a lot of moths do that. Uh, much to our frustration because we can't see the, up, the wing markings on the upper side of the wing and uh, that can uh, hinder identification. But this is a canary shouldered thorn here. So how do we tell the difference? Well in this uh, part of the world butterflies have antennae with a club on the end of it whereas moths here and here have a variety of shapes of antennae. Uh, and the only one approaching a club is the burnet moths, uh, but that's just a thickening rather than a distinctive like um, drumstick uh, effect. Technically, if you think about moths having two pairs of wings, there's got to be a way of holding the wings together so that the fore wings and the hind wings both beat together in unison and they don't get out of phase. And with moths, what happens is on the hind wing, there's a, a little bristle uh, in the male, two or three bristles in the female, which connect with a sort of clasp on the forewing. It's a bit like a piece of Velcro, if you like, and it holds the two wings together. Uh, you, very difficult to see that in real life, but that's the way it works. Whereas in butterflies, the way they hold a, keep their wings together is to have a big extension lobe here on the hind wings, which increases the overlap between the two wings. You quite often hear the term macros and micros with moths um, and they do vary incredibly in size from these very small, these are not the smallest uh, moth by any means and you can see there what six, seven, eight in the head of a buttercup uh, right up to the death's head hawk moth which uh, I think even that has got a bigger body than any other moth, but I think the convolvulus hawk moth might have a slightly bigger wingspan. So the, the range of uh, sizes is, is quite incredible. And the macros, which are the larger moths, numbers in the region about 900. So the remainder are what we call the micros. And uh, they tend not to have been looked at so much until recent years. They've been a uh, uh, a realm of the specialist. So what do moths, adult moths feed on? Most moths, uh, adult moths only live for a few days to a week. The main reason for them being around is just to mate and lay eggs. The rest of the, their life cycle is spent as a, as a larva, the majority of it. The majority of adult moths feed on nectar. 
uh, but there is a small number of primitive species which don't uh, which feed on pollen grains. So they've got uh, sort of primitive biting mouth parts, so they're very small micros. And there's a sizable number of moths which don't feed at all as an adult. So they only got a very limited lifespan because they can't uh, replace the um, energy uh, resources they need. Okay. If we look at larvae, what do the larvae feed on? Because they're the ones um, who are around the longest. We, we find out far the majority of larvae feed on leaves and buds, which is what you'd expect. A small number feed on live wood and stems, so they bore into live wood and stems. Some of them are subterranean, feeding on roots. Uh, quite a few feed on seeds and fruit, especially the micro lepidoptera, which being small can spend their whole life cycle within a single seed, some of them. Some of them feed actually on the flowers themselves, and then we get smaller and smaller specialized uh, micros feeding on uh, well, rather niche um, resources. As to what plants they feed on, you probably won't be surprised that the majority of our moths feed on our most common species of um, plant or tree. So we've got birch, sallows, oaks, and hawthorn, apple, and then smaller numbers on some of these um, less common trees. Uh, some of them like ash, for instance, is a common tree, but it's not something which is not a tree which a lot of larvae feed on because it has toxins in it. And you have to be a bit of a specialist larvae to enable you to um, deal with the toxins in the plant. And this quite often is the same for say you as well. Not many moths feed on you, for instance. And then you've got things like sycamore. There's not many moths feed on sycamore. Yeah, it's a really common tree. And of course, if you think about it, sycamore is not a native tree to this country. And so it hasn't built up the number of species to feed on. It does have these uh, native trees, which have been here much, much longer. How do they spend the winter? the Lepidoptera? Well, you can see straight away that most Lepidoptera, or the majority, spend their winter as a larvae, with uh, adults 7%, and the pupae and the eggs. Uh, pupae is still quite a high percentage. Um, there's obviously dangers here, aren't there? If you're a pupae and you're suddenly exposed because some a gale has blown your hiding place away, then you can't go back and hide yourself. So it's a bit of a a, a problem is whether you, you know, uh, spend your life as a pupae. So a lot of pupae you probably find are underground. Uh, they're not so likely to be exposed. Adults, on the other hand, if their hi hiding place for the winter is exposed, they do have the ability to move. Although if it's really cold, they don't want to have to wake up and move. That takes up energy resources. Uh, and then you've got eggs. Again, they can be secreted into very small places. Um, but larvae seem to be the biggest. And of course, a larva can move if it's disturbed during the winter uh, to find somewhere a bit more secure. So when do, when do they fly? Well, you can see here that the moths start in January, February, small numbers, and suddenly build up to July, August, when that's the most. So if you are going to start looking at moths for the very first time, the last thing you do is start in July and August because your, your, your mind will be actually blown by the sheer number of moths you could get in the trap and species. It's far better to start off early in the spring when the number of species are relatively small uh, and easy to deal with. And as you go through the year, you can find more and more new ones. It won't be such a, um, a shock, if you like. Well, that's not the whole story because moths uh, have certain times of year when they're out. Uh, some moths are winter specialists and some are summer and so on. So we're just going to look at a few of these phenology, phenology pot plots. And what we've got here is the months of the year when the moths are flying and also 
the latitude, that's how far north. And in order to visualize that, I put a mass map of the British Isles alongside this here. So you can see at 60 degrees, we we're up at the north of Scotland, 50 degrees, we're down here in Cornwall. And this red line is where we are uh, here in uh, Staffordshire. And so moths like the early moth only fly in February and March. So if you're not, uh, if you don't catch it by the end of March, you don't see it again until the winter. So they have a very restricted flight period. Similarly, you've got some moths which only occur in the autumn, uh, like the autumnal rustic. And you can see again here, September, October, it's uh, really common in the Midlands. But as you go further north, it's still around, but the actual number of moths uh, as, are not as many. Uh, so it's not quite so common up there, but it does spread right the way up to Scotland. And then uh, you've got moths which are purely in the winter. And the, the one which is out now, which is this beautiful thing here, the December moth, comes out in October, although it's called the December moth. But again, you can see it's really much commoner in the south and the Midlands. And as you're going further north up towards Scotland, um, it's uh, not quite so common. So, and then you've got what we call um, sort of two, uh, well, uh, two generations almost. You've got the coming out in October, November, the chestnut, but then it hibernates during the winter and emerges again in larger numbers in March and April. So this one goes to sleep, if you like, over the winter whilst the weather's really bad and then re-emerges from its hibernation and um, becomes much more common in March uh, and April. But that's it. You don't get it in the middle uh, here in these months. And this knowledge can help you in identification sometimes, especially when you're first starting. You think, oh, I wonder if this is a chestnut. I've just caught it in July. Well, it's not likely to be a chestnut because chestnuts don't fly then. So time of year of flight is really quite a help in identification as you'll we'll find out later. We then have this phenomenon of two broods, multiple broods. So with the early moth, we have a brood which emerges in April and May, lays its eggs, the caterpillars turn into chrysalises, which then emerge again in July and August. So they're two separate broods. And the autumn brood, uh, it quite often is different in slight colouring. Uh, but you can see from this that there are more records of the second brood of early thorn than there are of the spring brood. And also you can see here that in Scotland, the early thorn is flying a little bit later, May and June, to the peak, which is in the south of England. And this may be a weather related and uh, temperature related. Oops. So where do we find moths? Well, I put this map up. It's from this beautiful uh, publication, The State of Britain's Larger Moths. And the deeper the colour, the more species of moths there are per 10 kilometres square. So first of all, the first thing you see is you're much better off in the south of England, as always with insects. There's more insects south of, south of us than there are uh, north. And that's because it's obviously climate uh, as much as anything else. But here we are. This is the Midlands. And we've got Staffordshire here, Shropshire, uh, Worcestershire and Herefordshire. And we can see here, we're going to get on average in a 10 kilometer square, something like, uh, I don't know, 250, 300, 400 moths per 10 kilometer square. So we don't do too badly uh, for moths in, in, uh, in Staffordshire. And in fact, um, I think in your garden, you could expect 300, 400 species over a period of time, which may surprise some of you, I think. So, Certain species of moths are restricted by their food plant as to where, you, where you're going to find them. Uh, for instance, we've got the rock row, the Cistus forester here, which only feeds on rock rows. So you're only going to get that where rock rows grows, and that's up on the limestone. 
around um, Dovedale uh, Mill and uh, that sort of manifold valley. There is another moth which looks very similar to this called the, the Forester. And if you catch um, a, a Forester or looking moth, a green moth down in, I don't know, in this part of the world in stone or somewhere like that, if you're lucky enough to find one, uh, you could almost guarantee to say, oh, it is the Forester and not the Sisters Forester because rock rose doesn't grow down here. Otherwise, the two moths look almost identical. So knowing the food plant can also be an aid to identification. Similarly here, the orange underwing moth is a very common moth flying around birch trees. But there is another species, the light orange underwing, which actually feeds on aspen. So if you're at all concerned about whether you've seen a light orange underwing or an ordinary orange underwing, you need to see or make sure you've got or haven't got aspen growing nearby. Uh, Aspen's not particularly common in this part of the world, but uh, it's always worth checking if you think you might have the rarer light orange underwing, check whether you've got aspen. So if you're on Canic Chase, for instance, and you see an orange underwing flying around the birch trees in April, it is going to be the orange underwing because I don't think there's any aspen on Canet Chase, or at least not enough uh, for there to be a colony of light orange undoing. So food plants are a good uh, thing to know about. And similarly here, these two moths are almost identical, except one feeds on oxide daisy, the other feeds on tansy. So if you're uh, around a tansy plant and you see this moth uh, on, on it, then it's going to be, be this species. Uh, if oxide daisy then it's likely to be this but otherwise the two look very very similar so food plants useful uh, to know about habitats useful too i mean certain species of moths are only found in certain habitats manchester treble bar for instance is only found on bogs and mosses so in our area it's only found on chart, uh, chartley moss sorry uh, Similarly, the fox moth, you're only going to find that really up on uh, heaths, uh, Canic Chase, for instance, the North Staffs Moors. Great Oak Beauty looks very similar to a very common moth called the Willow Beauty, which feeds, uh, which get, we get loads of in our moth traps. But Great Oak Beauty is a rare species, which is only found in really ancient oak woodlands. So again, if it's in your garden in the middle of stone, it's more likely to be the uh, willow beauty and not the great oak beauty. Uh, so again, habitat can be an indication as to what your species is. And similarly, this new species coming into our area is a, a species associated with the uh, quarries and uh, chalk and limestone grassland. So you're not likely to see it anywhere else. So uh, again, that's a good aid to identification and confirmation. Uh, so let, going on to where we're going to find them uh, ourselves, we're going to find moths indoors. Quite a few species of moths are found indoors, including this one, which is the common clothes moth. Uh, most people think moths are dirty and brown and feed on their clothes. Well, only a few, pe few moths feed on clothes, and then it's only the caterpillars. And um, this is the one which causes most of the trouble, and it's not that common these days since we started using artificial fibers. Brown house moth, white-shouldered house moth, often found in houses. They feed on just detritus really around the house. Twenty plume moth, quite often you find on walls in houses, indoors, and that, that feeds on honeysuckle. So if you've got honeysuckle in the garden, you might see that inside the house. I mentioned before something like 140 species fly during the day and this is one which most people see, the green longhorn. Uh, the males fly in great flocks. Flocks, I don't know if that's the right word, but we can see here. Um, I'll just let the video finish. So that uh, is a swarm of male green longhorns um, flying around to attract females. And that's not uncommon uh, in the spring to see, but they only fly during the day. They don't fly at night. Um, similarly, we've got moths like uh, 
this mycoptis calfella, which is an habitual day flyer. You get it in, in buttercup heads. The burnet moths we're all familiar with. They fly during the day, mainly not at night. Uh, chimney sweeper, again, is a day flyer rather than a night flyer. The mint moth is coming into gardens these days, uh, feeding on garden mint and um, oregano. Uh, and again, that's a common day flying species, although it will fly uh, into moth traps as well. So these are day flyers. Some moths don't fly during the day. You more or less see them by disturbing them when they will take flight rather than habitually flying. So the grass moths, You've only got to wade through a grassy field in summer and these moths get up, they feed on grasses. The mother of pearl feeds on nettles. So wherever there's a nettle patch, if you're walking past it, you might disturb one of these sitting as you will this one, the little nettle tap. Uh, and then again, shaded broad bar, uh, again, a typical grassland species, which you might disturb or see during the day rather than it flying uh, on purpose. Quite a few moths will spend their day on tree trunks and they're adapted in their camouflage, uh, which we'll cover in part two of the talk, but they habitually try and hold themselves flat against the tree trunk. So looking at tree trunks is always uh, a good thing. Uh, you might come across something. Uh, this one is an ash feeder and it's sitting here on a tree trunk. So tree trunks, people always think I'm a bit odd when I'm going around staying at tree trunks, but I'm looking for moths, honest. Uh, and then we've got moths which aren't there, if you like, and these are the leaf miners or traces of where the moth's caterpillar has been. And we can identify the species from the shape of this wiggly line, which is the mine where the caterpillar has spent its life. It sort of lays an egg here, and then as it gets bigger, you see the mines getting bigger and bigger, and eventually it will emerge up here. So the shape of the mine, the plant that it's on, can help you to identify the little leaf mining moth which has made it, so you don't even need to see the adult necessarily. Uh, so another thing, place we can look for moths is on flowers. So the flowers which butterflies have been feeding on during the day are worth looking at at night. And we can see here this little Udia lutealis feeding on, on a, either a Deronicum or something like that at night, and Budlia globosa, uh, this cloudy bordered brindle uh, feeding on it. So it's always worth checking your plant garden plants at night, take out a torch and have a look. But if we really want to survey moths, we've got to attract them to us some way because the number of moth species that you find during the day just walking around is not that great. Um, so in order to attract them, we've got various uh, techniques we can use. One is to use what we call sugar or sugar mixture. And really it's, everybody's got their own recipe for this. Um, it's either a mixture of syrup and molasses a little bit of alcohol in to subdue the moth a bit. Uh, and they equate, some species will just sit there for hours and hours, just lapping up this mixture, which you can boil up in a saucepan and then spread on a tree trunk or fence post or something like that. And you can see here all these copper underwings on this sugaring patch here with one red underwing down here and the buff arches there. Another way you can trap moths is to use the fact that the female moth attracts a male by emitting a pheromone or scent. And this has been used for a long while in pest control, especially with this moth, the coddling moth. And you can see here the pheromone, all the male coddling moths have come in here onto this sticky pad and of course have been destroyed. But in recent years, we've been able to synthesize pheromones of a lot of species which have been inherently difficult to monitor and we can use them to attract them. And one of those species is the emperor moth. Uh, so here's a pheromone lure. And if we just play this, it will just... Uh...
I'll just wait for it to finish. Uh, so. So we took this lure, Sue and I, on to Cannock Chase, and within about a minute, I had 10, 10 emperor moths around my legs. And thereafter, they kept following me because they could, they could uh, detect the scent, which was actually uh, rubbing on my jeans. And so they were all around my legs. It was quite the most incredible thing I've ever seen. Uh, so emperor moths lure has been a fantastic um, resource if I can go on to that yeah the next one group of insects which pheromones are used by the females uh, the clear wing moths and there's about a dozen species of clear wing moths which up to now we didn't know anything about really they're very difficult to survey they burrow into tree trunks and they emerge during the day for a short period of time and people have always thought uh, they've been quite rare, but we've now got the pheromones for these. And again, it's revolutionized our knowledge of the distribution of clearwing moths. So this is a six belted clearwing coming to a lure. You can see there. And again, they, they feed on bird's foot trefoil, which you can see there. Uh, we've used one of these lures and within about a minute, we got 10, 20 uh six belted clear wings around the lure and we just didn't even know they were there uh one which has just been released one pheromone uh is one for this moth the lunar hornet and it uh again we're finding it all over the place whereas before it was a bit as sort of rare as hen's teeth if you like nobody used to see this moth and uh We've had it even in our garden in stone. Um, we've had four or five of these around our pheromone lure. So pheromones have been a, a godsend really for moth uh, recorders. But without doubt, the best way to attract moths is to use their um, attraction to light. And it doesn't have to be a proper moth trap. You can have a lighted window or sheet outside with a torch or something like that. But the factors which uh, attract, uh, which influence moth catches are you need a fairly high night temperature. Moths are cold blooded insects. They need quite high temperatures to fly. A low wind speed. High humidity is quite good. So a little bit of light drizzle doesn't go amiss. Low moonlight so that your moth trap becomes a sole light source, if you like, rather than being uh, moths being put off by the moon shining or something. Your trap needs to have a fairly high UV. Moths are attracted to ultraviolet and it needs to be isolated. So you don't want all the street lights around it if you can help it. There are various traps on the market. These are some by Anglian Lepidopteris supplies. There are other people who make them. And uh, I suppose the sky's the limit is how much you want to pay, but basically moth traps like this are mains operated. So you'd need either a generator or uh, a main supply at home. Some of these others can be adapted to run off uh, battery power. Um, you can buy the bits and pieces yourself to make your own moth trap. So all these are available as individual parts. And then in the morning, you come and you identify, uh, empty the moth trap and this is what you find. Uh, this is why you don't start in the summer if you've never looked at moths before. <laughs> uh, but when you're recording, and we're gonna deal with this in part two, it's important to record the date, the location, that's the name, site name, and the grid reference the species and the numbers of the species and obviously your name as, as well and you send that data to the county recorder 
But identification, the first moth books which came out were really only affordable but to the landed gentry, uh, et cetera. And they were all hand colored plates like this. And nobody but nobody ever sees moths like this. And the reason they're like this is because they've been colored and uh, drawn from set specimens. Uh, other words, dead moths with a pin through them in a cabinet. Uh, and this in the old days was the way people caught and studied moths. You actually had to collect the specimens yourself because there wasn't the literature available for you to, there was no web to go and compare the pictures with. So your specimens became your illustrations. And this moth here was the one which book, this book was the one that started most mothers off. Richard South's two volumes, Moths of the British Isles, which deals with all the macros. And you can see they're set specimens. And similarly, Skinner, when he came out, they were all set specimens. So you really had to have the insect down there with a pin through it. And this is why moths were always a bit of a niche interest. People just didn't have the time, the space or inclination to take all these specimens. But that was the way it was. There was no other way around it. There was no other illustrations. And then we got this field guide here by Martin Townsend and Waring with Richard Livington's illustrations. And they illustrated for the first time all the moths in their resting positions, as you would see them in the moth trap. And together with Manley's photographic guide, the latest third edition illustrates all the moths, including the micros. Uh, things have jumped on Im immensely. Coupled with that, we've now got a field guide to the micros, which have always been the sort of um, poor relation, if you like. So there's a lot more interest in micros. And coupled with the digital camera, we now no longer need to take so many specimens. Uh, the pictures can be uploaded to the web. There's loads of people there to identify stuff for you. The actual identification itself involves looking at various features on moths. And we've got on the bigger moths, the macros, these various, I don't know, lines and marks, which are usually there, uh, either colored in or not colored in, or the space between these might be colored in or not colored in. So you're looking at these markings whether they're there or not, whether they're outlined in white or whether they're filled in. Th these sort of features uh, are used just like the wing bars and that on a bird would be, you, they're used to help us identify. When it comes to the sort of carpet type moths, you don't so much get the stigmas, but you do get lots of lines. So you'd be looking to see whether this line is here or that line is present or absent uh, and that sort of thing. The problem starts in that moths bear, can vary within a species. So this moth here and this moth here are the same species. It's just that a genetic variation of this moth has the space between the bars filled in. So they're both ribbon waves. And this is what starts to confuse people when they first start. This here and this here are both common marble carpets. This is a very common form of it but it's still common marble carpet. So you haven't just got this to look at, you've got all the variations to look at. So out of two and a half thousand species, you've probably got you know, nearly 4,000 different varieties as well. So it can take a little bit of getting your head around. And then you've got this, this one species varying from pale here right through to dark, and it's still the same species, the lunar underwing. And the problem with the field guides is they cannot, in all fairness, illustrate every variation. So they might illustrate that and that, but not the in-between variations. So that's something else to be uh, aware of. Another thing that moths do, which is rather annoying, is have melanic varieties. So this moth here, the peppered moth, which is very famous um, moth used in genetics, is normally white, so you can't see it on this lichen-colored uh, 
tree, but the dark form of it sticks out like a sore thumb. And during the Industrial Revolution, when tree trunks became much darker and sootier, the dark version of the peppered moth became the most cryptically colored and the white one uh, was quite obvious. And obviously this would be the one which predated in preference. And so during the Industrial Revolution, the white form became the rarer of the two forms of peppered moth. But today, with the uh, clearing up of the environment, the number of peppered moths of the dark form uh, has almost disappeared. So that the typical form of peppered moth has started over the years to become more and more common. And up here, 2015, 16, 17, almost 100% of the peppered moths caught at Kiel were the white form whereas down in 1979, it was only 20%. So the environment's cleaned up and the peppered moth now has reverted back to this being the typical and the uh, more common form. But these melanic forms obviously don't have any markings. And so there's one or two species where it's very difficult to identify them. You then got sexual dimorphism, which you do in birds, I know. So the females of some species are different to the males here the ghost moth, here the muslin moth. And you've got winglessness. So here is a female uh, vapor moth. She's got no wings. She hatches out of her cocoon. She's mated by the male while she's still inside the cocoon for a girl. She gets out of the cocoon, lays her eggs around the cocoon, and then she dies. So she has not much of a life, really. Um, and you might think, well, if she's wingless, how do the larvae spread? And what happens is when they do emerge, they spin silk, just like spiders do, and they get carried away on the wind and spread that way. But winglessness is quite common in moths which emerge at this time of year, because at this time of year, moths like the winter moth, the female climbs up the tree trunk to lay her eggs, on the tips of the oak trees, perhaps. And if she had wings, she'd get blown around all over the place. So having wings can be a distinct disadvantage to a moth which uh, is around and laying eggs at this time of year. So winter moth, mottled umber, all got wingless females. And then you've got another issue, and that is this species here, this moth, could either be the gray dagger or it could be the dark dagger. You cannot tell the two apart. The caterpillars are different, but the adults are not. And in that case, you do need to take a specimen and dissect it. Okay, and you can see here that the genitalia of the gray dagger and the dark dagger are quite different, which you'd expect, but you can't see that from a live moth. So normally we'd record that as dark stroke gray dagger and you can't tell what it is so just summarizing very quickly we're nearly at the end now identification summary i cannot stress enough that you must get a field guide you cannot do it all just on the web the web is a secondary resource which is you which is great for confirmation but Get a field guide and read through it regularly. Flick through the pages, get to know the sizes, the shapes, the colors, the markings of the moth. And then when you come for one which you don't quite know, you think, oh yeah, I remember seeing that. And you can flick back to it. Read through field guides regularly. Read the text which goes with the illustration. It's no good just looking at the picture. You need to read the text to see whether it flies at the right time of year, whether it occurs in your area, what its food plants are, and what the distinguishing features are. Not just look at the picture and compare pictures and pictures. If you don't know what it is, take a photograph or let it go. Don't try and make the illustration fit the moth that you've got in front of you. And be critical. Look carefully, if it doesn't show a line, it's, it's not because it's missing, it's because it isn't there and that's not the moth uh, that you, you've got in front of you. Just look very carefully at them, not uh, just take a quick glance, be critical in your views. And books can only illustrate a few examples. 
some species are incredibly variable. So check out the range of images on the web. And if the moth is worn, it's best ignored, at least when you're first starting anyway. And not all species can be identified from photographs, unfortunately. Uh, so you do need to be aware that in some cases, specimens will be required. So how do you know that you've got the identification right? You can get it horribly wrong, especially when you first start, uh, even when you've been mothing for a time too. Um, so look at the current distribution maps. These are available on the website of the uh, West Midland uh, Butterfly Conservation. These will tell you if the species is likely to be in your area and whether it's rare, scarce or common. Um, if you think you've got a rare, scarce or new species for the county, then it's check your identification again before submitting your records. Check it with a, on, online. There's one or two nice websites. Uh, Moth ID UK is very good. And um, pay attention to the habitat you're in because some moths have restricted habitats. You might think, oh, it's this species. You go and look it up and you find it's only flies on Heathland and you're here in lowland Staffordshire. The chances are you've got it wrong. The flight time, if, it's, if you've uh, got a species, um, there's a moth called the common Quaker, uh, which flies in April and May, but there's a similar one called uh, Vines Rustic, which flies in September. So if you've got a moth, in September, that looks like a common Quaker. It's not going to be one because it doesn't fly at that time of year. It's probably the vines rustic. So flight time is really a, a useful identification tool. Check for similarity to commoner species. I know you might get a rarity, but on the whole, most of us get common stuff. So always rule out the common species first and check for presence or absence of food plant. Uh, so if it's a moth which feeds on, like we've had before, rock rose, uh, and you think you've got it down in um, lowland Staffordshire, it's not going to be that because rock rose is restricted to the limestone. And if possible, take a photo. And then you can always ask your county recorder uh, what, what he or she thinks your species is. So that's all I wanted to cover tonight, but uh, next week I want to talk about how do moths survive during the day. We've got a nocturnal species. How does it avoid getting predated during the day? So we're going to look at camouflage, uh, how that works. We're going to look at how the state of how larger moths, which uh, ones are coming, which ones are going, how that uh, is reflected in Staffordshire having a look at have we got enough data yet and how you can help because all this, uh, these maps, uh, distribution maps, et cetera, they're all down to us. We're the ones who um, uh, are, are collecting the data. So it's really, we are really important in the acquisition of data on our, our moths. So I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna stop my share. Uh, does that take us back? Absolutely, so, yeah, that's uh, perfect. We'll leave it at that. Uh, then you've got questions. Uh, we have a five minute break, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much, Dave. That was really, really interesting. It was really brilliant to hear all of that. And uh, I want to use this five minute break to go and set out my moth trap now. Um, <laughs> Maybe not the best night to do it. But yes, we will take a quick five minute break now. So grab a cup of tea, drink of water, go to the loo, feed the cat, whatever you need to do. And then if you've got any questions that you want to ask, um, pop them in the chat box or you'll, you'll be able to unmute yourself and ask them if you've got those. Uh, so we'll see everybody in five minutes then.